So I'm here to talk to you today about mindfulness for your personal and our collective evolution. And I'd like to begin by telling you a little bit about how I began this journey into practicing meditation and then later on teaching it to people with cancer and researching its effects. So I grew up in Calgary, did my undergraduate degree at the University of Calgary in psychology and finished that in 1991. And by then I'd had enough of Calgary. I had to get out. So I took a year off before grad school and I went backpacking around Europe and the Middle East. And I wanted to immerse myself in new cultures and new ideas and see historical sites. And one of the ideas I began to explore was meditation. And I read a few books about it and I began to have glimpses of the experience of the sensation of something larger than myself, something vast, boundless, expansive, a sense of clarity and freedom. I really wanted to learn more. So in 1992, I moved across the country to Montreal and began my graduate program in clinical psychology at McGill. Um, and it was there I had that opportunity. His name was Neil. Now Neil was a mature student. He must have been in his 30s at the time. To me, that was ancient. And he had a bald head and a big bushy beard. And he had this aura of calm and quietude. And he spoke with a soft voice and a slow pace. And it turned out that Neil had just returned from seven years, seven years in the forest in Thailand, where he was practicing meditation and studying Buddhism to be a Buddhist monk. And there he was on my doorstep. So Neil said to all his students, if anyone's interested in learning meditation, I'm more than happy to teach you. Well, I jumped at the chance. And he invited us to his tiny little apartment on a weekly basis. And the first week I showed up, I was the only one there. And we sat down on a little cushion and he rang a bell. He said a few words of guidance. And then we sat there in silence for 40 minutes. And then he rang the bell again and he said, how was that? And I was just happy it was done. <laughs> And then he said, well, Kurt called and told me he was going to be a little late, but he should be here any minute, and then we'll do it again. <laughs> All right, then. <laughs> so we did. Um, you know, and I learned a valuable lesson that night that's carried me on through my teaching of meditation, that as a teacher, if you ask a lot from your students, you'll get a lot. What did I know? I just wanted to learn how to meditate. If you had to sit there for 40 minutes or 80 minutes, all right, then I would do that. So over the next five years, a group of us met every week. We practiced meditation, and it became a very important part of my, my personal life and how I got through grad school and other difficulties. So then in 1997, I moved back to Calgary to do an internship year in clinical psychology, and one of my rotations was at the Tom Baker Cancer Center. And it was there I met my colleague Michael Specka, who's since become kind of my partner in crime and a group of other counselors who were just beginning to develop a program of yoga and meditation for people with cancer. And that was it, I was hooked. So I helped run that program and develop it and evaluate its effects. And since then, we've had over 2,000 people through the program in groups of 15 to 20 people at a time. And we've conducted numerous research studies. So that's what I'd like to tell you about how, even in the face of something as difficult, and life-threatening is cancer, mindfulness can be a tool for evolution. So let's begin by talking about what is mindfulness anyway? You've heard this word a lot probably thrown around. So Time Magazine would have us believe that mindfulness is a blissful state where you clear your mind, become very peaceful, and you turn into a beautiful young woman. <laughs> Maybe I'm doing it wrong, I don't know. So there's a number of myths about mindfulness out there, and one is that it's always blissful and your mind becomes completely clear, you have no thoughts. Well, in the real world, our definition of mindfulness is non-judgmental, present moment awareness. So just knowing what's going on when it's going on. Okay, and sometimes what's going on isn't blissful or peaceful. You know, it could be, oh, I got a pain in my back, my knee hurts, and geez, when is this gonna be done? Okay, but that's all right, because mindfulness is about being aware of everything that's going on with acceptance. So we think of mindfulness in two ways. One is a way of being in the world. It doesn't take extra time to be mindful, just like it doesn't take extra time to breathe. Now the dog here is winning the, winning the contest. <laughs> mindfulness is also a practice. 
mindfulness meditation, we set aside time during the day to sit down and train our minds on how to be mindful. So you don't have to sit on a rock overlooking the ocean to do this kind of practice, but that might be nice. Might be dangerous at the end when you try to get down in the dark. But. So mindfulness, present moment, non-judgmental awareness. Simple, but by no means easy. Because look what your mind's doing. Okay, we have over 50,000 individual thoughts every single day. And almost half of them, 46.9%, are not in the present moment. They're what we call mind wandering. So when our minds are wandering, where are they going? Well, think about where your mind's going. For some of you, maybe it's into the past. You're saying, why me? Why aren't things better? If only this or if only that. I wish this had happened or that had happened. I should have, could have, would have. Okay, and those kind of thoughts lead to depression, regret, and anger. Or maybe your mind's rushing off into the future. Oh my gosh, how am I going to get done all the things I have to do? And what if this happens? And what if that happens? And oh, I'm so stressed out and worried, right? So you're not in the present moment. Your mind is wandering. And this research also shows that when people's minds are wandering, they're less happy. When you're in the present moment, you tend to be happier. Why? Because all that stuff falls away. All the regret and the sadness, all the worry. The future is a fantasy. The past is done. You can't change it. All you get is the present moment. That's it. We only have moments to live. This moment, the next one. But it turns out that if we can be in the moment, it's usually pretty much OK. And if we can really wake up and really be in the moment, things can be much better than just OK. Things can be awe-inspiring, majestic, beautiful, joyful. OK, so how do we do that? There are three main components to practicing mindfulness. The first one is your intention. This is the why of mindfulness. Why practice? So intention can be very simple. I just want to be more awake and more present in my life. Intention can also be more esoteric or more community oriented. I want to have a better sense of connection with the people in my life. It can be transcendent. I want the cessation of suffering for myself and for all beings. I want personal liberation. Or maybe you just want to sleep better. That's your intention. The next one, the next component is attention. This is the what of mindfulness. This is what we actually do, the heart of the practice. What is mindfulness meditation? It's training your attention in a new way. We spent years, our entire lives, training our minds to do those unhelpful things. It takes practice to learn the skill of being in the present moment. So we set aside time every day. We sit down, and we hone our attention. We're learning a new skill. It's just like playing the piano. You can't learn it from reading a book. You have to do it. So we do the practice. We choose, perhaps, to focus on the breath. It can be any object. But say we start with the breath. Your mind wanders off to the past, the future, analyzing, planning, whatever it is. You notice, you gently lead it back. When you do that, you're rewiring your brain. You're actually lessening the strength of the negative pathways that have caused you trouble. And you're growing neurons and making new connections in your brain that support a more mindful way of being. The next component is the attitude. How do you pay attention? And this is really important. Because you can be really critical and harsh and judgmental about your inability to pay attention. You can really beat yourself up about this. And that's not helpful. So you need an approach that's kind and compassionate and accepting. You know, your mind does all sorts of crazy things. It's not your fault. Right? Minds are like that. So we need to have this open, compassionate, sense of curiosity when we're doing this practice. So what happens when people do it? So we've been doing studies over the last almost 20 years for the benefits of mindfulness, and so have other people. So let's talk about the psychological benefits, kind of what you'd expect. People are less stressed out, they're less agitated, they're less worried, they have fewer symptoms of depression and sadness. That sounds great. I'd take it. <laughs> there is a sense of more connection with self and others. So reaching out from the individual to the rest of the world. People become more compassionate. They apply those attitudes. They become more compassionate to themselves and more compassionate to other people. And there's a sense of greater meaning and purpose in life for many people. 
So they become more authentic. They get in touch with their inner self and what really brings them joy, and they're more able to behave in that way. But it's not, not all just in your head. For the skeptics out there, it's actually in your body. Let's talk about some of the studies we've done. So with the people I've worked with, we've measured blood pressure in people who have slightly elevated blood pressure. Over the eight weeks of the program, they take home blood pressure monitor, they measure it every week, and we see decreases over the eight weeks that are similar in magnitude to what you get from a blood pressure medication, a statin. So I ask you, meditation or medication? Well, I'd pick the meditation. We've also looked at the immune system. We take blood samples. We look at what's happening with cells of the immune system, different cytokines. And what we see in a nutshell is that the inflammatory cytokines, which are associated with many disease states, they go down. And the sort of good parts of the immune system are enhanced. This is just over eight weeks. We look at stress hormones, cortisol, in the saliva of people over the course of several days. We also see changes. We look at the patterns of cortisol, and we see that there's less elevations in the evening when you don't want to have them, when they're unhealthy. And these patterns that we see evolving are ones that support better outcomes in terms of disease and health. The most recent work we've done looks at telomere length. So telomeres are the caps on the ends of your chromosomes in your DNA. They're like the little tips on the shoelaces that keep them from unraveling. And as we age, telomeres naturally become shorter. And shorter, telom shorter telomeres are also associated with greater risk for a, a number of different diseases, heart disease, diabetes, uh, even cancer. People who are more stressed also have shorter telomere length. So what we showed for the first time ever, that anyone's ever done this over a short period of time, is that people in our mindfulness intervention over the course of eight weeks, there was no change in their telomere length. But compared to a randomized matched control group, their telomeres became shorter. So we showed maintenance of telomere length, the first time associating it with a psychosocial intervention. So the media loved that one. This is what they had to say about it. So changing our DNA through mind control, says Scientific American. I didn't realize we're doing mind control, but apparently we are. And there was quite a lot of hype about it. So first. World first evidence suggests that meditation alters cancer survivor cells. So it's interesting to me, and there was 300 stories on this. You know, they didn't really care that it was making people feel better, which is what I care about. They cared that it was changing the biology. So let's go back to where we began. Mindfulness, a key for personal and collective evolution. So let's imagine a world where people know more what's going on when it's going on. They're more mindful everyday sort of interactions. So, you know, the bad driver who cuts you off in traffic. What if you could think about their suffering and realize that they're just like you and they only wish to be happy and they're not doing it to get you angry? Would you be more kind? Would there be less road rage? Maybe. What about when your teenager is telling you off and being rude and using that voice? What if you could feel the tension, the anger in you and the urge to lash out and escalate? Maybe you could take a deep breath, be calm, and just listen. It changed the whole trajectory of that conversation. And more importantly, on a personal level, what if you could be happy now, right now, in this moment? Not down the road when, oh, you know, you land that dream job, or you finally meet the perfect partner, you finally get that divorce, <laughs> you make more money. Not then, but now. Because if not now, when? It's very true that we only have moments to live. So I'll end with a quote from the poet Mary Oliver in The Summer's Day. She says, doesn't everything die at last and too soon? Tell me, how is it you plan to spend your one wild and precious life? Thank you.